Hello and welcome back to the AFL High Performance Podcast. My name is Jack McLean. Um, I'm your host today and I'm lucky enough to have Dr. Lachlan James as our guest. Our key topic for today's chat will be everything you need to know when it comes to tailoring strength assessments for elite athletes. Welcome, Lachlan. Thanks for, for jumping on, mate. Really looking forward to our chat. Jack, pleasure to be here, mate. Thanks so much for having me. No doubt. The listeners will be well aware of your background, Lachlan, but uh, for those tuning in that um, aren't aware of, I guess, how you started in the industry and, and your journey in, you know, in um, yeah, strength and conditioning and um, and the world of performance sport, do you mind providing a bit of a background, I guess, in, in how it all started, both from an academic point of view um, as well as your, your teaching background as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so currently I'm Senior Lecturer and Researcher at La Trobe University here in Melbourne. Uh, most of my research is embedded with um, pro clubs in NRL, AFL, Super Rugby and at institutes of sport like VIS, QAS and the like as well. So that's what I do now, but my path to get here wasn't a direct path, uh, certainly not typical for most academics. So I've had just roughly 10 years in academy, which includes doing my PhD, and then prior to that, 10 years in industry. So I'm originally from Brisbane, born and raised, and then uh, finished my undergrad in about 2004, 2005. And so during that time of doing the undergrad, so from the early 2000s, like this shows how old I am, by the way. So you know, 2002, three, four, um, you start working in the industry a little bit, mainly as a PT, as a personal training, certainly in those days. Um, so then I finished my undergrad degree at QUT and then decided I wanted to travel the world. So in 2005, I left Australia for close to 10 years. Um, I had one year in the Caribbean, so in the Cayman Islands, and I worked at World Gym there. So this was in like 2005 to six or so. Um, so that was a bit of fun. And then after that, I moved to Vancouver, Canada, where I spent the remainder of my time overseas, so a good eight to nine years or so in strength conditioning, applied sports science, private practice. And so towards the end of that, I, so about eight years after finishing my undergrad, I've finally got motivated to do some sort of post-grad work. So I did two master's degrees, uh, both through Australian universities, one through um, the University of Queensland and then another coursework master's through uh, Edith Cohen University. So through doing those, I really kind of got a taste of the research academia side of things. And having been on the training floor for close to 10 years, that was getting pretty draining, particularly, you know, when you've got to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning and scrape the ice off your car in Canada and then drive to work and then all that. So it, it can take it out of you. And then going back and doing further study through postgrad really opened my eyes and got me inspired. So also around that time, MMA was getting really big in Canada in particular because Georges St. Pierre was world welterweight champion and there was lots of attention on him. And I had a few athletes that were competitors in the sport at the semi-professional amateur level, as well as BJJ athletes as well. And I saw that there was an opportunity there to do some, some cool research on the, the performance characteristics of MMA athletes if I wanted to ever go down that research pathway. So I decided that's what I'd do by way of a PhD. And so to do that, I relocated back home to Australia. This was in about 2014 or so. So I moved back home to Brisbane and went to the University of Queensland there and did my PhD investigating MMA athletes. And sort of through that, I was a little bit unsure whether I wanted to kind of go the high performance route, the applied route, or kind of a, a blend of academia and applied sports science. And it was the academia side of things that really kind of stuck to me at that point in my career. So I decided that was a path I was going to pursue throughout the PhD and then afterwards. Towards the end of my PhD, I was offered a job in Ballarat with Warren Young, who's well known for his reactive strength work and agility work. So I moved down there, which was an amazing experience. And then uh, a year later, I was off the job here at La Trobe um, University in Melbourne, where I've been ever since. So that's kind of my my pathway to where I am today. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks thanks for sharing, Locke. And um, I guess going uh, casting in mind back to, to those experiences, like at what point did you sort of um, come to 
the realization that we need to, I guess, all be on the same page when it comes to strength and power qualities. Like obviously there's lots of different terms that are thrown out there. Uh, and I've recently just finished and you did a developing strength and power course um, that you can purchase online through the Trope. And um, it, we were talking a little bit off air just before about, um, yeah, I guess the value of, of the industry being on the same page and having alignment with, with communication. But you know, where did those sort of five strength qualities come about? How did that, um, yeah, what was the sort of evolution, I guess, with those? Um, yeah. Sort of um, most, of, most of my research questions or area of interest come out of personal experience and, and issues that I've encountered myself that I'm looking for a solution for. So I remember early in my PhD, you know, you're managing counter movement jump data and then loaded jump squat data and all that sort of stuff. And you're pulling out these dozens of metrics and you're like, well, which, which ones do I choose? Do I just pick a force one and a velocity one and a power one? And then I'm like, well, there's got to be kind of a, a better way to do this. And so you start looking at ways of tackling that sort of throughout the PhD. And then when I moved to Ballarat and worked with Warren Young there, his PhD, a lot of which never got published that he did with the Australian Institute of Sport in the 90s, actually solved this problem and looked at strength qualities and managing all these metrics and then kind of boiling them down into a couple of distinct factors or domains. Um, it was with kind of a not quite as many variables as what we deal with today. In fact, probably only a fraction of what we deal with today. But nonetheless, there was kind of a framework there that that he applied to answer this question of how we deal with sort of all these metrics. And this this ranges from you know counter movement jump stuff to maximal strength stuff, right? So I saw that and that I'm like, okay, this this is a pretty good framework. It makes sense. So maybe this is what we should do to to deal with this challenge now of the overwhelming number of measurements that are available from the, the positive of having all this force time data from force plates, but the challenge with that comes managing the data and finding out what exists. So what I looked to do, and this is a this is pretty common practice in, I guess you could say data science, is dimensionality reduction. Is So you've got all these metrics that span across multiple tests. So one test can be broken down into dozens of metrics. We've all seen that with, say, counter movement jump. Um, or with a mid-thigh pull, something like that. But also then you've got your traditional metrics too, like a 1RM squat and the like as well that, that you'll want to include in your model. So you go through a process of what's called dimensionality or data reduction, which really simply just tells you what sort of latent factors or constructs exist within the data. So it'll find out which clusters of variables exist. And within a cluster of variables, all those variables are going to look very similar. They're all going to point the same direction. They're going to be tightly correlated. But then the clusters themselves are going to be different from each other. And that's good because your ultimate goal with any sort of measurement model, even if it's for overall physical qualities, not just strength, is to capture unique individual pieces of information that you can isolate and contextualize the physical qualities, or in this case, the specific strength qualities that exist and that may need attention or that may be already developed. Because once you can zero in on a particular quality or factor, then you can start directly training interventions to them. If you've got five or six or seven metrics in your model and they all point the one way because we're all correlated, that's not very helpful. So that's kind of the, the goal is to find out which unique pieces of information exist within your data set. And you do that by things like principal component analysis or factor analysis, even just simply running some correlations, right, to see, okay, which variables are all tightly correlated? We're going to put them as a cluster over here. Which clusters of variables are different from that? You put them over there. You can kind of keep building that. You might end up with three, four, five, six, seven clusters of variables, depending on the data you've got. So you can do that within your own data, but we can also do this from a research perspective, looking back historically through the literature to seeing which ones correlate together and which ones tend to not correlate as strongly. And then you can also do it with data in a research setting too. And so look, putting all that together based on looking at the literature, looking at our own practical data and looking at research data that we've moved forward with recently, it seemed like there were roughly five domains or dimensions of strength and though each of those dimensions are suitably different from each other. And within those dimensions, 
you're going to have a bunch of variables that are all tightly correlated and you can kind of essentially make a decision on which one of those variables from within a domain you'd like to bring forward and move into your model, um, considering some other factors as well. So that was kind of the, the framework or the, the genesis to getting towards this five-factor model of strength expression. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for yeah, explaining, I guess, the, the background and, and how you came to, to those five. Um, how many did you sort of have to remove like to the original, you know, five years, 10 years ago, was it 10 that you, you know, once you're going through this process, you, you sort of landed on five or was it, um, yeah, I guess talk us through that process in, you know, how many. Yeah. So again, like there's a, there's sort of a statistical way. approach you can go, but what happens is you kind of go to a point. So if we add another dimension or domain or factor cluster, whatever you want to call it, how much more information does that add to our model? Right. So if we added a sixth domain, you know, maybe it could be something to do with, uh, let me just think something. Maybe it's stretch shortening cycle function, right, regardless of, of the action. So maybe you add that and you see, okay, that adds maybe another 5% more information to our overall model. And you add another domain, okay, maybe that adds like 1%. Another domain, maybe that adds like half a percent, right? So you see, you make a decision at what point adding another factor domain dimension doesn't really give you much more information, and that's when you might go, okay, adding more to this isn't giving us that much more information, but it's creating more things that we're going to have to look at in our model, which can be distracting. So we we make a choice as to how much information we're willing to accept through how many dimensions we're going to be looking at. So you just make a cutoff point. All right, adding more doesn't give us that much more information. And it's seen around five or so dimensions or domains seems to capture the vast majority of the variability in maximal force expression. And look, this, this can differ a little bit depending on context as well. I mean, this is sort of a general five-factor framework, but you, I encourage practitioners to look within their own data to see what trends occur. Because as a dimension or a domain becomes more relevant to a sport, so let's say um, reactive strength or heavy strength, as that becomes more relevant to a sport, you need to dive deeper into it. So rather than having a single test that may pick up that dimension, you might need a couple of different tests because you need greater resolution on the domains that are more important. And for those that are less important or less relevant, you can get away with less information relating to that strength dimension because it's kind of just going to merge together so there's a there is a bit of nuance to it so it's important that you sort of tailor this to your own context yeah it's a good segue for the next question obviously maximal dynamic strength and fast strength seem to be particularly important with athletes um, can you explain why these qualities are so critical in sports performance and ultimately for the coach listening in how should we train specifically to target them um, yeah how does that differ from i guess your stock standard strength training program that's been done over time. Sure. Now, I guess probably an important point to get to before we get to that point is what are these five five different domains that, that we put forward? Um, so just to, to clarify on that, we've got your maximal isometric strength, which is like peak force derived from isometric mid thigh pull or isometric squat. Then you've got explosive strength, which is the early stage force from that same test. So some measure of force, rate of force development, force at a time point, about 150 milliseconds or earlier. So it's two. And then you've got heavy strength or heavy slow strength, which is just your lifting strength, one, three, five RM. Uh, maximal dynamic strength, fast strength, which is what we might call it. And that's what we'd colloquially call power. So put that in there. And that's typically something that has a, a longer movement time up to around one second. And then finally, we've got something like reactive strength where you've got a really fast stretch shortening cycle action that occurs. Um, so that's less than 250 milliseconds. Something you get from, say, a drop jump with a cue to be quick off the ground. So you have those five roughly different domains. And then the question is, all right, so does heavy dynamic strength, so your lifting strength, 135 RM, and then the training for that, and then your maximal dynamic strength, which is your maximal power, typically called something derived from a counter movement jump or a squat jump or a light loaded jump squat. So why why do they seem to be 
most relevant. So that does seem to be the case when you're looking at it at the sport population level. Those ones seem to seem to rise above. However, it's always important to look at it with your own context, with your own athletes, with your own sport, because the sport's going to dictate what the most important domains are. And then even within a sport, you're looking at the game model that the coach wants to employ and that the athletes are capable of employing. And then you need to kind of work backwards to find out, okay, which strength qualities are most associated with those. So that's all part of building a performance model, which you really need to do in order to get to the crux of which strength qualities matter the most in your context. Heavy dynamic strength, so lifting strength, seems to rise to the top in many occasions because probably perhaps one, it reflects the ability to apply force against heavy loads, which is important in collision sports, but also it transfers across domains, which is really important. So for example, if you're relatively weak, let's say if your one RM back squats less than one and a half times your body mass, you know, below parallel, if you're at the roughly that strength level and you do heavy dynamic strength, you're probably going to get some of the other qualities for free. You'll certainly get increased maximal power. So measures derived from say a counter movement jump, you'll get benefits in that domain as well. So because training that spans across domains or the adaptations transfer if you're relatively weak, then that seems to be an important training focus also. Um, and then measures derived from a counter movement jump seem to be particularly important because it has sort of a sports-specific movement velocity. So you're moving with maximal intent at high velocity and you're sort of relatively unconstrained with movement time. So that's perhaps why it's risen to the top in the literature. But also, they've always been easy to assess, right? It's easy to assess a 135 RM squat, easy to assess a counter movement jump too, even if you just had vertex or chalk on a wall. It requires a bit more nuance to assess reactive strength, where you're quantifying the contact time and then the jump height and then the cues and the feedback associated with that, as well as your maximal isometric strength and your explosive strength, which come from the same test where you require force platforms, understanding of how to use in instrumentation and a fair bit of familiarization, make sure you get good data as well. So I think there's still more to learn, but to, to provide a rationale for why heavy dynamic strength and fast strength seem to rise to the top, I think those are the, those are the key factors at this stage. But again, you need to look at your own sport, your own context, and then build a performance model to see where the associations are between the different strength domains and the key aspects of your sport. Yeah, and then um, you mentioned uh, obviously the, the professional environments that you've you've worked in in research as well. Like, have you seen a specific environment uh, or heard, or spoken to people in the industry um, that are using these five at a really high level? And you know, how would that differ to perhaps other programs? I, I guess specifically around the isometric max strength and then the explosive strength as well. I think it would be interesting to to dive into because perhaps they're not as popularly used methods as as the, the, the heavy dynamic or the um, the dynamic strength? Yeah, really good question. So I only put the paper out, it might have been two years ago, with the goal of simplifying strength measurement systems for, for everybody. Um, and we've started to see some, some uptake, certainly within, say, the National Institute Network. So I know that I know it's those those bodies, so particularly the QAS, they're looking at using those five domains to inform sort of monitoring and tracking strength quality. So it, the the five factor model is starting to be picked up, which is really cool. Um, so it means that those in the trenches are finding it, it useful. So then you've got then the second part of your question was talking about isometric strength and heavy dynamic strength and and how they're employed and sort of the understanding of that. So this is an interesting one to unpack. We're talking about here maximal isometric strength, so a peak force derived from mid-thigh polar iso squat, and with respect to your lifting strength, so 135 RM and then the associated training underpinning that. So how do they line up? This is interesting because when you say maximal strength, it could mean either of those two, couldn't it? And you're yeah. reading the literature, you're talking to colleagues, you're in the training space, you say 
that term and it could literally mean either it's like flipping a coin right and so so people use them interchangeably in practice but also in the literature which is part of the problem right now the key aspect of this is is that they're they're not the same and they're not interchangeable the two very different forms of force expression. So you, you look at the cross-sectional correlation and so it's roughly around 0.7 or so, right, which is about 50% shared variance, generally speaking, in non-weightlifters. So when you've got 50% shared variance, that means you've got 50% of the performance unexplained, right, which means very different. Now, what's even more important is when you track the changes over time, isometric peak force versus heavy dynamic, those changes don't track together at all. So if you're using one to inform the other, it's not going to work incredibly well, generally speaking, based on the data we've seen. And did a pretty extensive meta-analysis on this recently with over 100 participants in that meta-analysis, 100 points. And it showed that the relationship between a change in peak isometric force versus a change in 135RM of the respected dynamic version of that test was was essentially zero. Um, that doesn't mean it may not be true in your context, which is why you have to look at your own data to see if that holds true. So what do you do, I guess, with that understanding? You need to train them and assess them differently. You need to understand that that measure derived from the isometric lip thigh pull or isometric squat contains different information to that derived from your 135RM test. And then you need to make a decision on which you're targeting. Are you targeting maximum isometric strength? Are you targeting heavy dynamic strength? And then decide on which one you're going to be focusing on. And don't assume that a change in one is, is an indicator of a change in the other. And so that's probably the best way to, to kind of tackle that aspect of, of strength expression. Yeah, the In terms of, I guess, the foundation, it sounds like the, the maximal lifting strength, your 1 and 3 RM, 5 RM, um, is popular amongst programs, institutes, um, due to, it, you know, I guess, its ability once you're relatively weak. So once you're a developing athlete, that'll it'll help uh, all the other qualities uh, to a certain extent. For, for those on the other end of the spectrum, the strong athletes, uh, in perhaps like a sport like rugby, where strength and power is, is so important, um, well, where do you where do you sort of for over a year would you almost save the isometric strength to peak for maybe a, and sharpen up for a finals campaign? Do you think in terms of is it like your ace card of a you know where it has a real strong influence from a stimulus point of view for a period of time, or is it something that just should be a stock standard part of the program um, throughout majority of the year? You know, maybe like nine ten months of a of a year for a rugby athlete. Yeah, I think. I think it's going to be dictated by your needs analysis of the sport. And if you feel that it's going to be adding what you want to your training intervention. So I think that's the key part. So we're talking about here the the training of isometric strength specifically. Is that sort of is that sort of your question, yeah. Jack? And for for the stronger, for the guys that do have that above two times body weight of um dynamic maximal strength. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think you're going to get a great bang for your buck in that context The from isometric strength training. There's been a lot of great research work done in that space, particularly with Danny Lum, who's a, an adjunct lecturer here at Latrobe. And then in the practical space, of course, with, with Alex Natera demonstrating the, the benefits of incorporating isometric training within a dynamic strength training environment. So it comes down to the dose, you know, as they say that the dose makes the poison. So do you, you can get away with small doses that will go a long way in my experience. I think you would generally be careful of substituting entire phases, isometric for dynamic, dynamic for isometric one way or the other. You, you Generally, the bulk of your training is going to be heavy dynamic. And that's going to be what your focus is with doses of isometric training in there. But the important thing to consider is that as an athlete becomes stronger, they're going to need more and more specific and targeted training interventions to adapt. And the transfer across, across strength qualities is likely to be less as you become more trained. So if you're identifying that 
maximal isometric strength is going to be a key factor at this point in time, this athlete, then you need to really zero in on that. If you are identifying that for this strong athlete, explosive strength is going to be really important, it's important to zero in on that. Now, if they're less strong and less developed, you can get more general adaptations from the training that you give. So you might identify explosive strength as important in a particular cohort. If they're not as strong, you'll find that there's a greater transfer of training from your other strength domains to that one. So you can be a little bit more general. And that's kind of a good framework to, to think about. So most of the time, you're going to get sort of general adaptations. But as you get towards that pointy end, you've got to zero in on that aspect. So maybe there's actually a maybe there's a particular position within isometric, within an isometric strength test at the pointy end that's really relevant that you need to zero in on. Or maybe there's a particular heavy load within heavy dynamic strength that you need to zero in on if you're finding that that's very important for your strong developed athletes. Similarly, at the other end, or still at that highly developed end, but if the quality is, let's say, it's reactive strength, if you find that that's particularly important for your sport and your athlete's super trained in that, you might need to really zero in multiple drop heights and start to build a bit of a profile of them. Whereas if they're less trained, you can get away with probably fewer jump height, drop heights and a little bit less resolution with that quality. So that's kind of the, the process you can go through. Yeah, that'd be good to, to move into, I guess, developing reactive strength for field-based athletes. Um, what are some of its um, contributions towards athletic performance uh, when developing reactive strength? What, what are some of the, I guess, results that we uh, could expect to, to see or the athlete could expect to feel uh, for their on-field performance? So, so reactive strength is a bit of a colloquial term and it maybe isn't the best term, but it's been, been using it for decades to describe a fast stretch shortening cycle action. So something where you have a contact time of less than 250 milliseconds or so. And that's where you're cueing someone from a drop jump, for example, to be quick off the ground and then high as they can go. And you want to make sure that contact time is less than 250 milliseconds. That's as an example. Um, it has these mechanical similarities to high speed running, which is where you can see some pretty good transfer there. Also jumps off single legs. So you're looking at things like triple jump, high jump, long jump. That's where reactive strength becomes incredibly dominant. So it's going to be different depending on the sport, the contribution of reactive strength to performance. But the key take home point is, is that if you're, if you start training, for example, heavy ballistic tasks or just general ballistic tasks like a counter movement jump or a squat jump where the cue is to only maximize height and there's no cue for contact time or movement time, then you're not going to see much transfer to reactive strength. It really is a distinct strength domain. The shared variance with fast dynamics, I would say a counter movement jump is, is like 30 or 40% depending on the population. So there's still the majority of the variance unexplained, which means if you've decided that reactive strength is important in your context by going through your building of a performance model, which, which is a whole other process altogether, then you need to zero in on that particularly. Because even at the lower level, even if you're less trained, the transfer to reactive strength is relatively limited from the other strength qualities. So you need to zero in on that. Now, what does that look like? That could be anything from... Pogos to bounding to sprint bounding, anything where you're maximizing the height or the distance while also minimizing the contact time. So you're increasing the stretch load. You have these high peaks of force. There's a rapid stretch shortening cycle occurrence, and you're still going for maximal distance. So variations of what we'd call plyometric training because you're manipulating the, the stretch load or the contact time. Um, is going to be what you'll need to really see those adaptations. Yeah, you hear that, um, yeah, there's, there's, you know, jumping, which is the small, sort of slower stretch um, that you're talking about in terms of the power development, like one metre per second for like a counter move jump and then plyometric, but there's that reactive component to it. Do, do you know where the 0.25 sort of originated from? Is that uh, is it a number that we're 
yeah, we're all just following, but yeah, you can sort of see it with it. Yeah, when something's like 0.5, you can see that that's significantly slower than 0.2 um, and, and the load that we put under the body. And I imagine obviously there's a, there's a difference of a stimulus of what's going on from tendon involvement to muscle. Um, but yeah, where, where do you reckon that, or have you heard of where the 0.25, you know? Yeah, it's funny. There was a question that came up on, on this, actually on LinkedIn the other day, which is a, a fair point. Obviously, there's nothing that magically happens at, 0.251 that doesn't happen at 0.250 is there so it's a, it's a continuum right so i think generally speaking you'll find that that's the quickest you can get most people to perform off the ground through queuing right so generally that's probably the quickest you can get them if, if you don't queue sorry like if you go quicker you're probably not producing a um, you know, high force. So, and you'll find that many, many athletes just simply aren't able to do that. So they need a, a training adaptation to get to that point. So without, without training for that particular task, you find most people can, the, the fastest they can go at least is 250 milliseconds. So that's kind of a, a rough cutoff. Um, and so you can make a judgment call, right, as a coach. And I think this is the important thing to consider is, so you'll cue to see them get off the ground as quick as they can. And you're going to look at that contact time when you're cueing that, right? So you want to give immediate feedback to the athlete. And you'll see at what point they can stop, they stop getting any faster. They stop improving. So they've started to get familiarized throughout that trial. And at that point, I think you can accept that. Now let's say that gets that's 2.275 milliseconds off the ground. Then you could probably safely accept that. So the you're working really towards a cue. Maybe that's a better way to look at it. You're working towards a cue, which is as high as you can, as quick as you can, until the contact time and let's say the reactive strength index value starts to stabilize. And once it stabilizes, then you can accept that as a value that you can move forward with. From a training aspect, it can be a similar thing. The cue is to be quick off the ground, quick off the ground. And then you as a coach make a judgment call on whether you feel that was quick enough or whether you feel as though they're still focusing more on the output and not enough more on being quick off the ground. And that, I think that's a coaching decision that you get to make. Yep. Yeah. And when, when it comes to using technology, like we've talked about with force plates, um, what strategies do you think are most effective uh, when implementing the, the strength measurements uh, in a in a training environment, um, and how does that sort of inform our thinking? Yeah, good question. And I think this is the case with technology in general, too, is to have a bit of a almost a checklist where you can decide on what works in your environment. And so, the part of that checklist will be the traditional measurement property, so things like reliability validity, the independency of information. So by that, I mean, is it capturing something that hasn't already, isn't already being measured, right? So you look at those and say, okay, is it ticking those boxes? But then there's kind of a, another layer to that that you want to consider as well. And that layer is, is how it can inform or how you can make decisions based on that information. So if you're looking at choosing a metric to bring into your practice, is it going to actually inform training? Is it going to allow you to make decisions off the back of that? And then finally, there's another layer yet again to that, and that's almost like a feasibility and a cost layer as well. How feasible is it to follow this into your training environment? So is it going to require a massive amount of cost to buy this thing? Is it going to require considerable tester upskilling? So do you need to upskill your staff in learning how to use the instrumentation and learning how to pull out that metric and then interpret that? Is it going to require considerable physical space to get it in there? Is it going to require a large time cost to implement it and then to get the athletes through and using it, for example? So you need to look at all those things and then almost tick them off or give them a, a check mark and then decide, okay, based on what we've got here, is this a fit for our environment? And perhaps the very top of that checklist 
almost like a gatekeeper question should be, is this valid to my context? So is the measure that I'm looking at giving me information that relates to an aspect of sports performance in my context? And once you tick that, you can move forward with those other questions. If you can't tick that box, none of those other questions matter because you could tick all the other boxes, but if there isn't, if it's not related to an aspect of sports performance within your sport, then it's not valid. And if you don't have validity, you don't have anything. So that's kind of a, the process that you'd go through to decide whether or not it it's going to be a fit in your environment. When it comes to like periodizing these different uh, qualities, um, I guess with that with that athlete in mind that um, has got a good level of strength uh, under their belt as, belt as well, so we are you know cycling their 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 um, training exposures to sort of keep them in tip top shape for the for the back end of the season um, come final. So cycling through with explosive strength, reactive strength, maximal strength, isometric, um, and then their power as well, the dynamic strength. Um, what would be so general advice in terms of prescription? Like if you're bringing a new quality in, like something like say explosive strength, is it you know, typically like three to five reps of you know, one to two seconds, two sets would be an area where you start? Like you know, how, how do you sort of bring in these qualities? You know, perhaps sort of more people listening in would be more aware of you know, you know, strength training, you know, the, the, the you know, maximal strength training and perhaps the power and how to manage their volumes in there, but maybe explosive strength that might not be, might have not used that in their program before. What would be a good sort of starting point for yeah, volume and, and intensity exposures, do you think? Yeah, so maybe this sort of is, requires some clarification too is, so you've got the test you use to quantify the strength quality and you've got the training associated with developing that. So when I'm looking at explosive strength, which is measured as that early part of the force time curve in an isometric test, that's not necessarily how you train it. So how what I would be looking at that is your weightlifting derivatives. So essentially you've got pull high rates of force development against heavy loads is really what you're looking at, right? And so high rates of force development against heavy loads, they're your weightlifting derivatives, or maybe some heavy loaded ballistic tasks, like a, a fairly heavy loaded jump squat, something like that. So it's important to look at it from that context. So for explosive strength, we're looking at, because we're assessing it against the movable object. So that's sort of essentially almost a, a heavy load. And you look at your concern about the rate at which you're applying force. So with your traditional heavy lifts, as you know, you're you're squeezing them a bit, right? So you're squeezing a heavy deadlift off the ground. You're kind of squeezing a squat out of the bottom and then exploding. Whereas with your weightlifting derivatives, depending on which ones they are and from which position that you pull from, you're generally looking at high rates of force development right off the bat, particularly doing lifts from the hang doing lifts from the hang with, with no counter movement as well. So they're probably some of the, the modalities that you would be looking at folding into if your desire is to improve explosive strength. So weightlifting variants, perhaps from the hang, moderate to heavy loads, whether you choose to catch or not is context dependent. You can probably get away without catching. So moderate to heavy pulls, from the hang, perhaps with minimal counter movement, although you may periodize that in, it's going to be context dependent. But that's probably going to be the key modality that's going to drive adaptations to that particular strength quality. And for uh, if you're using gym aware, like some form of accelerometer, is there a threshold of, of minimum, for, let's say for that movement there, that like a, a shrug um, that you want to you want to see to be able to get that consistent stimulus for explosive strength? So you can almost look at it like, okay, we want to go as heavy as we can and still move explosively. All right. So what, what does that look like? So one strategy is, is to consider what's the failure velocity of a hang power clean, let's say, right? Or a power clean, if that's what you're looking at. And so it's almost like your minimum velocity threshold for a typical heavy dynamic lift, right? Like a, a squat or a bench press or something like that. So if I know my failure velocity or minimum velocity threshold for a hang power clean is peak velocity 1.50, roughly, maybe it's 1.60, 1.50. So I know that I can leave the ground with that 
just just leave the ground with that. I certainly can't leave the ground with a weight any heavier that results in a velocity slower than that. So now you've got a mark. So you can start to program perhaps with that in mind if that's what you're looking at. If you want to move as heavy as you can while still being explosive with velocity where you can still leave the ground, then you start to work backwards with that in mind. So maybe you're saying, okay, I want you to make sure that all your reps are above 1.70 meters per second peak velocity for three reps, but they need to be below 2.0 meters per second peak velocity, for example. So now you've got a range or window within to, to move there, right? And you can, of course, play around with that. There are times where you want them to be moving closer to that failure point. So they're doing three reps, heavy, explosive, but there's not a fourth rep there and there's probably not much more weight that could be added. And other times where you're going to allow for a bit more velocity stimulus, maybe, okay, keep below 2.0, but keep above 1.85 or something like that. And so that's how you can start to use velocity to inform your explosive strength training just off the top of my head there yeah, yeah that's fantastic i think that's a, yeah, it's good good to get it i guess yeah some uh tangible um i guess areas that people can apply that area so that would be for for fast strength as well as if you're trying to improve improve your maximal isometric strength as well there should be a transfer to the isometric the explosive isometric strength as well or is it different if you look so that it. should that should transfer to the early part of the force tying of time curve from an isometric test. That's yep. so your explosive strength is measured that way. So that that will transfer. It's super sensitive to training, which is a, a good thing. It also makes it important to get your measures reliable as well. So anything that's quick and fast is sensitive, which which can be a good thing because you can train it, but it also you also lose it quick, and it's also important that you dial in your measurement qualities your measurement procedures for that something that so the alternate side to the coin is something that's super stable and that's super reliable right but doesn't move a lot and that would be maximal isometric strength so the peak part of that force time curve so that's super stable super reliable easy to test doesn't change a lot you really have to do some damage to somebody to, to see a change there. So that's sort of the flip side to the same coin. And now the transfer to peak like isometric forces is that issue we were discussing previously, right? You, there will be a little bit of transfer from your heavy strength, but there may not be a lot. You might have to focus more on the isometric action itself if that's what you're looking at. But the transfer from explosive strength training, so weightlifting derivatives, to peak isometric force, it's going to be looking outside of weightlifters, first and foremost. It's going to be relatively limited when compared to targeted training on that. But what you will see is that early part of the force time curve change. And that's kind of what we were talking about here. If that's the quality that's important to you as explosive strength as measured by the early part of the force, force time curve, then you're going to see some really good adaptations as a result of utilising the weightlifting variants. And what would be, you know, um, why wouldn't we get, why wouldn't we prescribe the test itself as the prescription? So just doing explosive isometric you know, training, whether it be, let's say you, you don't want to um, familiarise them too much to the actual test. So let's say you test, you choose the isometric bit like the pool, but you do a training block of um, squat ISO and you're really cueing them to be explosive in the ISO. Would, what would be... At Absolutely. Yeah, it, using, using that as a form of training is 100% on the money and you can totally do that. Why would you not always just train the test in any context to improve the test? It's because you're not going to see the transfer because you're not training just for the test sake. You're training for transfer to performance. So you're doing the training that you know will transfer and you're using the measures to give you an indicator of how that training is progressing. So you would absolutely include that as part of your training prescription to an extent. But remember, the goal is transfer. And so to transfer, you're probably going to want to have the bulk dynamic would be a fair way to say it. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yep. Uh, what, what do you think are some common mistakes or pitfalls to, to avoid for 
um, practitioners that are looking to incorporate these five strength qualities in their programming for the upcoming season. It's the perfect time because it's the off season now. So they're reviewing their their processes and um, yeah, I guess for someone looking to to go down this road, what would be some advice you give them? Well, or, yeah, I think I forward? think practitioners are, and this this is part of my job. Everyone's doing their best. They're they're really trying to find solutions to. I don't want really to call it a problem. You know, the challenge of overwhelming numbers of measurements that that you can choose from, right? And this this is off the back of a really positive step in improvements in technology in the training environment. It's overwhelmingly a net positive that we have this technology in the training environment. But a challenge that comes along with it is teasing out the metrics. So I think that simply by looking at the framework, if you can look at the framework that, that we've put forward, that's going to really help you. Maybe maybe the challenges for us on the academic side is, is making that framework more familiar to those in the trenches. And I think that's probably the key and that's that responsibility is on us. And I think I think once we do that, then we're arming practitioners with the knowledge to then make some good decisions on their own because their goal is obviously to do the best that they can and to win premierships, to win cups, to win gold medals. And if we can arm with the knowledge to do that, then hopefully that makes things easy. So I think I think everyone's doing their best. I hesitate to say the, the biggest mistake. I think if I had to be really specific and say one thing, which I've done too and it's easy to do, is you're probably choosing too many counter-movement jump metrics. Probably the, the biggest general mistake. You can explain the counter-movement jump. I don't want to pick on it, but um, it's just a common one that we're familiar with. You can explain the counter-movement jump in like two or three metrics, statistically speaking. You can get away with that. So something that represents how high they go, so something an output type measure, something that represents the, the duration of the movement, okay, like time to take off or movement time or contraction time. They're probably your two big ones. And then the third one could be something that describes the counter movement displacement. So how deep they go on the counter movement, how quickly they drop into the counter movement. So that'll tell you pretty much everything you need to know. So probably the, the common error is because there's so many metrics that are available, you end up choosing half a dozen to represent the counter movement jump. And now you've still got four other qualities that need to be described, but there's only so much space on a report. But there's, and more importantly, there's only so much cognitive space for the end user when they're looking at these numbers. So if you've got six metrics that describe one thing, there's not going to be much attention left over to, to see what's happening with the other four or five factors of strength expression, let alone all of the other metrics beyond strength that are relevant to sport. Thanks for sharing, mate. And I guess to wrap up the, the topic we've been speaking over an hour now, I feel like there's plenty of information there for practitioners that were perhaps interested on the topic uh, or looking at, at doing the online courses uh, would be highly invested now. Uh, but yeah, what would be sort of the take home message, I guess, for um, athletes, but but more importantly, I guess, for the coaches looking to implement this, this model um, into their framework? I think take home message would be to keep it simple, there's only so much data the end user can interpret and then to operationalize. So be selective with what you include. Make sure that what you include in, encompasses or captures a unique aspect of strength expression, right? So similar to what I said before, you don't want four or five things that all tell you the same thing about the same quality. You want what we call independency of information where each measure or a couple of measures tell you something really specific that isn't captured by another couple of metrics somewhere else. So that's probably the biggest thing is that independency of information. So you've, you've got unique aspects of strength expression that are being accounted for, but minimal overlap. And I think that's, that's a good rule of thumb to have. Fantastic. I really appreciate you coming on, Lock, and um, sharing with us. For, for those that have any follow-up questions, um, where's the best place to, to connect and, and get in contact? Sure. Um, hit me up on X or on LinkedIn. That's probably the 
easiest way. Um, and happy to share my email, Jack, um, if you want to post it up somewhere. It's l.james at latrobe.edu.au. Um, you can hit me up on, on the email as well. More than happy to, to answer questions. Make sure to, to follow up, guys, if, you, if you're listening in. I'll add all those links in the show notes. Uh, final three question, mate. Uh, pet peeves, do you have anything that sort of fires you up from an industry perspective? From an industry perspective, pet peeves? Um, this is a cop-out answer because I quite like what I do. <laughs> work um no one likes admin right so i was thinking of, a, of an answer to that but dealing with admin you got to do it you know that's you're getting paid but uh i think admin it's kind of sucks yeah yeah well put uh favorite way to spend a day off oh uh, with, with my wife and two beautiful daughters um doing anything perhaps perhaps a sunny day go to the beach but yeah with my family and uh, obviously with the recording of this late September in 2024, mate, what, what's on the horizon for the rest of the year? What are you excited about at the moment? Yeah, so for the, the rest of this year and in, into next year, I'm excited to see where some of these research projects take us that we've got going on at the moment. A lot of cool projects underway with some awesome PhD students, some great partners. So I'm excited to see to see where we go with that. That's always one of the best parts of the job. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be staying tuned as well. Thank you again for, for the content that you're providing um, for, for coaches like, I, I got like myself, um, just to make it a lot more of an efficient process to stay up to date with the research and, and ultimately how to apply it into practice. Uh, yeah, hugely valuable and yeah, really, really appreciate you coming on, mate, and, and sharing with us your experiences and journey um, in academia and, and ultimately helping out uh, the industry, I guess, be on the same page and, and be consistent across the board. Um, thank you for everyone that's tuned in live as well. If you're tuned in halfway through, make sure to watch the rest of the episode on our YouTube channel. We'll post it on our podcast in the next few weeks. And our next live interview is with Darrow O'Neill, an SNC coach at the GWS Giants, which will be 5 p.m. Thursday, the 3rd of October. So I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thanks, Jack. Fantastic.